Dear Amy, I must write a special letter and thank you for the dream in the bottle. You are the first person in the world who sent me one of these and it intrigued me very much. I also liked the dream. Tonight, I shall go down to the village and blow it through the bedroom window of some sleeping child and see if it works. With love, Roll Dahl. That was the letter that he sent to a young girl called Amy in 1989 after she had sent him a bottle of coloured water, oil and glitter. And of course, he knew right away what that was. It was a dream inspired from his book, The BFG. And in response, he sent her that note. Uh, and there's today's practical takeaway for you right away. It's about uh, saying thank you. It's about um, sending notes and cards. It's about sending uh, pictures of presents. It's about finding ways of being thankful to those who have uh, inspired us and brought joy into our lives. Uh, it's not always easy for us. Um, thank you can lose a bit of its uh, gravity because we live in, on the whole, uh, a very polite society. Um, you know that scientists have been working on a, a perpetual motion machine. Have you heard about this one where they have uh, a cat and then to its back they strap a piece of buttered bread and then when you drop it, it just keeps spinning before it hits the ground? That's a great joke, isn't it? Isn't that a great joke? You know our cats always land on their feet and buttered bread always lands butter side down? No, oh gosh. I like that. I like that one. Right, yeah, good. Well, oh, it's going to make the second half awful. So you can, <laughs> you can, uh, you can do much the same thing if you get a, a Canadian person and a British person together. You have them hand one another a gift, and um, they just go round and round saying thank you, thank you to one another. I think scientists are trying to weaponize that at the this very this very moment. But it's easy for us to um, to fall out of, um, or, or, or it's easy for us to find it difficult to, to find ways to say thank you in, um, in, in new and, um, uh, and novel ways that make uh, the reality of, of the level of thanks that we feel apparent to the other person because we say thank you so often. Um, and I was thinking about some of the things that I've been most uh, pleased to receive and the fact that even though they bring joy to, to my life so often, probably the people who gave them to me have no real concept of just how happy they've made me. Um, and I thought, what, what a shame that I've not allowed them to share in that happiness and that joy. Um, one of the things that we received uh, when we got married was a set of saucepans and uh, a set of knives, a big chef's knife that I use almost every single day. And chopping vegetables, like dicing onions, is one of my very favorite tasks during the day. I love dicing. I love getting the steel out. and I love sharpening it every day. I love getting my onions out and chopping them. And <laughs> Too much cooking, yeah. I like the eating as well. Um, and I don't think that, uh, that Helen's aunt, who, who bought those knives for us, uh, I don't think she has ever been told by me just how much uh, happiness they bring to my life. Uh, and I feel like I, I, want to, I want to share that with her. And I think we can probably all think of those gifts um, that we are our favorite toys or the things that we use every day, the things that bring us pleasure. Uh, and my takeaway is use that as an opportunity to share with those people who gave you those things um, just the joy and the happiness that they do bring to you. Uh, and if you can, find like Amy did, a novel way of doing that. I wondered whether uh, sending Helen's, um, Helen's aunt a, a sort of a shoebox full of perfectly cuboidal little bits of carrot or something might be the right way forward. Um, or it might be rotted by the time it reaches uh, the, the back and beyond of Cornwall where she lives. Um, but onto the, onto the text today, we have um, this one person healed of leprosy who returns and gives their thank you. Uh, and leprosy not only was it an awful disease to live with, but it carried um, 
enormous amount of social stigma with it as well. Um, not just uh, social stigma um, for, because people uh, were afraid of uh, contracting the disease, but also because um, it was part of the religious history and culture of the place to stigmatize it. This is what we read in Leviticus, uh, in the Jewish law. The leper in whom the plague is shall wear torn clothes, and the hair of his head shall hang loose. He shall cover his upper lip and shall cry, unclean, unclean. Uh, that trope from movies that we're so used to hearing, unclean, unclean, uh, this is where it originates. So what uh, a marvelous change for these people's lives when they cry out to Jesus and merely seeing them, he says, go present yourself to the priests and be made clean. Now, of course, um, the priests didn't actually cure them of their illness or make them clean. That was just the ceremonial bit that they had to go through afterwards. As they go on their way, they're made clean, just like we were talking about last week with the faith of the people. It's the faith that they have that if they follow Jesus' instructions, they will indeed be cured, that cures them. It's not the fact that they actually end up at the temple seeing the priests and giving their offering and their thanksgiving. It's the fact that they trust and that they obey. Go, he says to the priests, and on the way, they're made clean. Except for this Samaritan who never makes it to the priests. Um, the Samaritans were a sort of uh, schismatic group from uh, the Jewish faith. They were uh, Jews, but they worshipped at a, a different temple, uh, a different high place uh, across the way from Jerusalem. They followed different customs. Uh, the divide between them was uh, the kind of bitter divide that can only exist between very close family members. Uh, you know the way that you can you can dislike your, your enemy who's close at hand much more easily than you can dislike your enemy who's far away. And that's what it was like for the Samaritans. I suppose our closest sort of modern parallel would be uh, some of the um, grievous anger between Protestantism and Catholicism, or even uh, between Catholicism and the Orthodox Church that we've seen recently in uh, Pope Francis' visit to, to Georgia. Um, that sort of Catholic-Protestant uh, antipathy sort of dissolved to a large degree before I ever remember it. But uh, my dad often talks about the troubles uh, that he lived through in Northern Ireland. And it's that kind of anger of two people who should be um, comrades, who should be brothers and sisters, because they share so much in common, because they worship the same God. And yet the uh, small matters over which they disagree become the things that cause them to be at one another's throats. And so too it was between the Jews and the Samaritans. So imagine that you're part of this Jewish audience to whom Jesus is speaking, and you hear that, oh, by the way, this one person who came back and said thank you, they were a Samaritan. It's a, a slap in the face that you'd have been highly insulted. And Jesus uses this rhetorical device a few times. Uh, we find it in the parable of the Good Samaritan, where it's not the priest and the Levite who do the caring and the generous thing of taking care of the man who's been attacked by the robbers, but instead it's the Samaritan of all people who turns out to be the good neighbor. Or the Samaritan woman that Jesus meets at Jacob's well, who not only immediately accepts Jesus' claim uh, of being the Christ, but who also goes back and converts her entire village. And this works on the basis that there is an assumption that Samaritans are worthless, are no good, are bad people, are people who would not act in a, in a just way. The, way. the only reason this rhetorical device works is because when they hear that a Samaritan helped, but a priest and a Levite didn't, uh, they have to be surprised. And their first thought would have been, gosh, I can't be shown up by a Samaritan. Or even, have we fallen so far that these Samaritans now have better manners coming back and saying thank you than we do? There's a video that's been going um, viral on, on social media recently. Some of you may have seen it. 
it starts off um, telling you that the, the, the man you're watching behind a counter is um, a Muslim and he's uh, a refugee from Syria now in the United States working in uh, a jeweler's. And what you see unfold on the CCTV is a, a Texan mother coming in with her, a couple of her kids and she's trying to sell him uh, this gold necklace that she has because she says she's absolutely broke. Um, she wants to be able to pay her bills this month and be able to feed her kids. And she tells to him how much she thinks she needs and how much she wants to get for this necklace. So amazingly, he agrees to buy it for the full uh, price that she's asking. And she gives him the necklace, he gives her the money, and then he gives her the necklace straight back. And that works on the same basis, that firstly, it's meant to surprise the people that are listening, that their first thought is meant to be, oh, that's not what we think Muslims are like. And then it kicks in on a second level, where it suddenly exposes the latent stereotyping and racism of the society. Just like uh, Luke decides to mention that this person was a Samaritan, the fact that this Samaritan's religion and nationality are seen as being relevant to the story somehow. Relevant because everyone would have thought, oh, that's not what I was expecting them to be like. So too, this video, which when you first watch it through, you feel like, oh, isn't that a lovely thing to do? And then you suddenly think, but the reason that it's being highlighted and the reason it's gone so virally popular exposes the fact that for a large swathe of our society, there's some expectation that that's unusual behavior for that type of person. Uh, and then it hits you at a second level um, and doesn't just tell you something about the way you ought to behave, but tells you something about the beliefs and the prejudices that you hold as well. Jesus told the lepers to go and show themselves to a priest to confirm the healing. And the nine go. Um, where the Samaritan went to begin with, we don't know because he had no priest to go with. The Samaritan temple had been destroyed and there was absolutely no way that any Samaritans were getting into the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. None of them would have been allowed to set foot in there. No Samaritans welcome here. And so, ironically, the Samaritan returns to Jesus because he's the very person who can't fulfill the law. He's the one who can't go and do uh, the things that sum up to all righteousness. He's the person who can't go through uh, the proper channels in order to qualify his healing. Instead, it's his faith that heals him, just like it heals the others. And he receives God's grace. And his response is to praise, to throw himself at Jesus' feet, and to thank him. And we too experience healing from God. We too receive God's grace. And we too are excused from fulfilling the law. And we have no less reason than that Samaritan leper did to throw ourselves at Jesus' feet in adoration. Amen.